During the Second World War, soldiers didn't have the luxury of high-tech sleeping bags, insulated tents, or battery-powered hand warmers. They fought, marched, and bivouacked in environments that froze rifles solid and turned boots into blocks of ice. Yet, in the middle of that chaos, an unlikely hero emerged. Not a weapon, not a uniform upgrade, but a simple heating system so reliable that many outdoorsmen today still consider it one of the smartest ways ever designed to stay warm outside. It wasn't flashy. It wasn't complicated. It was the kind of tool that could be built, fixed, or replaced by almost anyone, and it kept entire squads alive in the cold. And here's the part most people don't realize. This same field heater can be recreated in your backyard using basic materials, and it still outperforms many modern camping solutions in terms of efficiency and fuel use. If you've ever wondered how soldiers stayed warm without modern gear, stay with me, because this forgotten piece of wartime engineering holds some of the most practical heating wisdom you can use today. Now, let's dig into the real history and the real technique. Understanding where the World War II field heater came from and why it worked. When American and Allied troops were deployed in cold theatres such as the Ardennes, the Italian mountains and the forests of Eastern Europe, they needed a dependable heat source that didn't require complicated equipment or a constant fuel supply. What emerged was the trench-style field heater, often built from a single ammo box, a mess tin or a fuel can punched with air holes and filled with a controlled burning fuel mixture. In other cases, soldiers used the original buddy burner system. Corrugated cardboard rolled into a spiral inside a tin saturated with wax or grease. It was simple, nearly impossible to break, and honestly easy to relight even after rain or snow. The key to its success wasn't just heat output, it was predictability. A soldier could count on one of these heaters to burn for an hour or more using scraps of fuel, and you know the flame was stable enough to cook over or warm hands without constantly adjusting it. Reliability under stress is what kept soldiers alive. Now, the brilliance of the World War II field heater, you see, really lies in its fuel mixture and airflow design. Wax, grease, lard, or even leftover ration fat acted as a slow-burning energy source. The cardboard or cloth inside served as a wick, controlling the burn rate in such a way that it prevented flare-ups and, well, helped the heat last much longer, with very minimal resources. The metal container kept the heat concentrated and, importantly, shielded from the wind. Just a few carefully punched holes allowed the correct amount of oxygen to feed the burn, making the whole thing both efficient and safe. To apply this today, you can, quite simply, replicate the principle using a shallow tin and strips of cardboard. Roll the cardboard tightly, pop it inside the can, and pour melted wax or cooking grease until it soaks through. It's a remarkably practical bit of know-how, even now. Once cooled, you light the edge and you have a steady, contained burner perfect for warming hands, heating a shelter, or even boiling water. This isn't reenactment. It's practical physics that continues to hold up, well, even 80 years later. Showing how soldiers used the heater for more than just staying warm. These heaters weren't just personal warmers. 
They were multifunctional tools. Troops used them to heat water for shaving when frozen beards complicated gas mask seals, to thaw weapon parts, to warm canned meals, and even to dry socks and gloves when trench foot threatened entire units. A single heater could turn a miserable night into something survivable, and a squad with two or three could, you know, build an improvised warming area under a poncho or tarp. In your own backyard or camp setup, the same principle applies. A small field heater can help you dry damp gear, warm a small shelter, heat water for cleaning, or, you know, just maintain morale during those cold weather overnights. One practical approach is to keep a compact tin and wax heater in your car emergency kit or hiking pack. It weighs almost nothing, never leaks heat until lit, and, well, it ignites even when conventional tinder fails. If you want to create a historically faithful heater with dependable outdoor performance, start with a metal tin that has a lid. Roll strips of cardboard into a tight coil and place them inside the tin. All right, so melt wax from old candles or paraffin, then pour it over the cardboard until it saturates it fully. Let it cool, trim the cardboard level with the edge of the tin, and, well, it's ready. Light the top, and you know it will produce a steady bluish flame that lasts long enough for warming tasks and light cooking. Another method, borrowed directly from World War II motor pool crews, involves filling a steel can with sand and pouring in gasoline or diesel. The sand absorbs the fuel and releases it slowly as vapour. For safety reasons, stick to the wax and cardboard version in civilian settings, but, you know, knowing the historical method helps you understand how soldiers adapted to whatever resources they had. Now, let me explain why this method, despite its age, still outperforms so many modern heating gadgets. Most battery-powered heaters, honestly, just fail when faced with proper freezing conditions. Propane stoves, well, they tend to struggle if you don't have the right canisters or regulators. And chemical warmers, they only last a few hours at best. The World War II field heater, on the other hand, burns just about anything that melts or can be soaked into fibres. It works in wind, snow and even freezing rain. Plus, it doesn't need any pressurised containers, no electronics, and really no specialised replacement parts. So, in a long-term emergency or a cold-weather camp, where, you know, weight and simplicity really matter, this method remains one of the most dependable heating solutions out there. And it's not just nostalgia talking. It's proven engineering from an era, frankly, when gear simply had to work or people died. If this deep dive into World War II's most underrated survival tool sparked a new appreciation for old-school ingenuity, do make sure you subscribe, share this guide with your fellow history enthusiasts, and keep joining me as we uncover more forgotten skills that still matter today. Backyard. Wisdom is all about keeping these timeless methods alive.